want to take a few minutes today to address uh, a ton of phone calls that are now coming in about what's happening to this corn. We talked earlier in the week in the podcast about frost damage and the fact that the north part of our territory got hit pretty hard. A lot of that corn was scalded and almost on the ground by Monday morning from the Saturday and the Sunday frost. But the frost was a lot more extensive than just the north. Pretty much our whole territory has been clipped by the frost, but it took till Wednesday before you could actually see it out here in the field itself. And a lot of phone calls coming in about herbicide damage, disease, what's going on with my corn. And guys that didn't realize they did get frosted, and it's frosted enough to knock that corn around. So I appreciate you sending the pictures in and that type of thing. We thought we would send some pictures back out through this video cast of what we're looking at so we can maybe clar clarify uh, the difference between the herbicide damage and what we're seeing. So here today, this is a small field. It's still at V1, and it's showing frost damage. We're on Monday. There was very little evidence that the frost had hit it, but by Wednesday, it was pretty clear. Okay, so the damage here on this leaf that you can see the scalding look uh, on this outer epidermis and the scalding here in this band. This plant was just emerging and the plumule leaf was uh, starting to unfold um, on Saturday and Sunday when the frost hit and uh, it caught that plant uh, right there in the little bit of a whirl that it had and that's where the damage is. So you can kind of see the damage kind of similar on all the plumule leaves. To some extent this one, the plumule leaf has already died and fallen on the ground itself. And you can see the damage in the next true leaf up here. So this looks like a potential herbicide or maybe even sulfur nitrogen deficiency. But you can tell by the by the discoloration and the kind of the uh, uh, scalding that you see on the leaf itself. Some of this is going to lead into what we call buggy whipping, like this one here where the burnt leaf uh, is dead tissue and the new growth is trying to push its way out from it. This corn is going to be okay uh, in this process. It's just going to take a little bit of time. The good news is, is we look right here in the whirl. The whirl on these plants is strong green, so it says this plant is um, coming back, coming back strong. And here within the next three to four days, it'll be back to full metabolism and off and running, and there's no problem. If you're in some of the harder hit areas and this whirl is not turning strong green by now, we well, have a concern, and we're going to have to watch those fields really close. They may not come back, and there's going to be some scattered plants that won't come back, especially if they had any type of seedling blight or issues early on before the frost itself hit. The problem we have here is this plant is not still uh, not at full metabolism rate, so we have to be a little bit careful with our herbicide post applications that we're going to put on here. Let's let this thing um, weather through this a little bit longer, get a little more stronger growth out of here, let that plant tell us everything's up and going good before we have to force it to metabolize a herbicide application. If we look at this particular plant, this is not buggy whipping. This is actual cutworm. So the cutworm have cut this plant off, and you can tell they just cut it off last night. It's still fresh and green, but it's been cut off. Unfortunately, as we scout this particular field, we are at threshold for cutworm. As a number of cutworm calls have come in today, uh, where people saw very little or no cutworm on Monday, and now the cutworm presence is really starting to step it up in the same way with this field. So we're probably going to have to treat this field this afternoon or in the morning for cutworm as I'm doing my counts out here, but I really don't want to throw my herbicide on corn. It looks as tough. 
So I'd love to be able to come in here and throw my marksman and my cutworm application on at one time and be done with it. Um, but I'm going to let this corn uh, get out of its tizzy with the frost and get back to full um, get back to full metabolism before I throw a herbicide at it. So I'm going to have to come in here and treat today or tomorrow for the cutworm and get them cleaned up. And then I'm going to have to come back in a week, maybe 10 days, and finish the process with my herbicide application. I know it doesn't, uh, efficiency isn't very good there, but at the same time, you really don't want to keep this corn um, in a tizzy any longer than you have to. The cold, wet conditions that we're fighting have, have done their number on this corn already, and then we add the frost to it, and it makes it a bigger issue. So, again, we need to be on the ball for the cutworm itself. And remember, we're talking about a 3% cut rate. You're going to be at threshold for the most part. So if we look at this plant uh, situation, it's not been damaged a lot, but it tells us the cutworm's here. And if that uh, percentage is going up, he's going to have to be treated. The thing about 3%, that's three plants out of 100. This is something you'll never be able to see from the road. Probably if you're not coming out here and counting off 100 plants or 50 plants at a time, you may walk right past 3%. I've been in fields where we we're well over 3% and a grower didn't realize it itself. So you're going to look for that cutting. You may mark the ground, count 50 plants uh, or 100, whatever you want to do, and come up with a percentage and mark that down so you can come back and check that field all the way through V4. So this corn's going to have to have four collars. Uh, four collared leaves shown before we're really too big for the cutworm to cut. And remember, our cutworm flights have been pretty steady. So it's one of those things where this is not one scout and done deal. We're going to have to stay on it, especially on the non-GMO or traded corn without insecticide. This field doesn't have insecticide on it, and it's uh, struggling a little bit. The percentages have went from a half percent cut to about two and a half percent, and we're going to have to do something with this here. But again, we can fix this at this stage without much loss. We just got to be on top of it. Something else that we're seeing of an abnormal high rate this spring, and I don't quite understand why, and that's bird damage. So you can see this one here. The bird has dug down around the seed, ate the heart out of the seed, and we're going to lose that plant. Um, first, I thought it was just in our plots, but as I uh, talked to a lot of you guys calling in as you're checking for cutworm and stuff, there's some fields where the bird damage, unfortunately, is probably equal to some of the cutworm issues out there. And the problem is there's nothing that we can do, uh, legally anyway, with these birds. But it is good to know where this lost plant came from. So when we're doing a, an, an ear count later in the season, and this was part of your stand, it was picket fence drop, it just got taken out by the bird. So adding a soil insecticide, thinking this is a, a cutworm problem or a rootworm problem isn't going to help the situation. It's going to be something that needs to be noted that we're having it. But typically, like the blackbird and pheasant issues are something that's uh, more prone to where the birds are heavier, for instance, in the south or out in the Dakotas. So we are seeing a lot of this, and I don't know what the reason is why, um, but you want to note that as well as you're scouting these fields, how much actual bird damage that you have.